morning, everyone. I'm architect Shweta Amri Shinde from Sankraman Design Studio. Uh, this has been an amazing session, a full day, uh, with uh, various uh, uh, ways of conservation process and from the expertise. And uh, right now, we would be uh, presenting uh, Godbandar Fort and Ausa Fort. We had a, quite an argument between both of us, not argument actually, that which fort should be, you know, kind of present first. Uh, uh, Godbandar Fort is something that uh, we uh, started, we got the work order in 2015. Uh, this is uh, basically, this is uh, under uh, adopt a monument scheme. Mira Minor Municipal Corporation adopted the monument and uh, so there was a different approach uh, for the conservation of Godbandar Fort versus uh, Ausa Fort which is directly from the state archaeology. So uh, we wanted to kind of present Godbandar Fort. Uh, I w so we have a, sp a short video, around seven minutes. So we wanted to kind of start with that. पहली तो जंगल होता ना जाम भी तू बता दे आता शिशांत बढ़ते गांव सर का गांव बढ़ते कारण का तो सुधारने के लिए ना आता सरकार सांसांग ले जाए लोग आता ना क्या in terms of its geopolitical situation was always this kind of driving force in creating trading outposts on such fortified sites along the entire coastline. Any opening in the coastline would always be like this kind of backdoor entry for creating a territorial superiority for any enemies. Even navigation was possible only at the such estuaries opening towards the sea. So Godbandar Fort, which literally means Ghod, the horses and Bandar, which is a landing place, derived its name from a port which was along the Ulhas River estuary, which itself was a place for trading horses, which came all the way from Arabia during the Vijayanagara Empire reign in the southern parts of India. The fort also uh, had a very strategic location because it allowed for an unobstructed river passage all the way from Basin to Kalyan, which also was a very significant shipbuilding port back in the 17th century. Most of the forts that the Portuguese built in the 16th or in the 17th century had a lot of scaling elements. So they used a lot of like big windows, doors or arcades and archways. The Godbandar fort actually is a coastal fort and that way is a very small size fort. It is possible that this was just uh, like a screen fort for the main fort. Although it is said that it has a kind of Portuguese to it but one does not find any kind of Portuguese inscriptions or the typical kind of uh, architectural language that the Portuguese used in their forts like say the angular bastions. The Marathas though under uh, Chimaji Appa defeated the Portuguese and they conquered this fort under Sambhaji the walls of the Godbandar fort were strengthened and this is how the fort again kind of came back into the Maratha empire. On the top of the walls, one sees these cornices, which suggests that there is a possibility that some granaries had some vaulted roofs as well. Apart from that, there are uh, a lot of uh, variations in arches that are found over here. The fort is primarily built in uh, puffed basalt, uh, which is also called as the Deccan Trap. When we kind of started off with the whole conservation uh, process for the fort, we saw that most of the walls had deteriorated. They were all to a height of say four feet. Maybe they were kind of vandalized by the locals around. The 
The bastion was one of the best preserved structure overall in the entire fort area. Uh, you see a combination of basalt overall in the other structures in the arch area, but bastion has uh, this chira stone which was uh, made much later. Generally bastions are something which is on the outside, but this is on the inner area of the fort. It kind of proves that this bastion was as a watchtower and uh, also in terms of trade it was uh, useful for the soldiers to have a good surveillance. You have this arch which has this kind of niche where they used to actually slid thick stone slabs to cover the bastion entrance. We had this huge pad land which was all empty. We created this conjecture to the fort which is uh, based on the Portuguese language of landscape. So we had this huge mango tree right in the center of the space and we kind of decided to design the whole garden around that uh, tree. So it was designed in a very low key kind of low maintenance way so that it actually sustains itself over the coming years. Even to kind of continue with the language we have used the basalt stone and then you know creating those kind of signages which in a way narrates the history of the fort as well. There was no direct entry towards the bastion. We uh, made it accessible for the uh, general public. Having a performance area or making people uh, come together is something that we uh, also did in our proposal. There were these boulders which were there, part of the existing fort. Mm -hmm. The boulders are still part of the intervention. It's still uh, undisturbed. The first thing was where we removed the cement concrete which was there on the existing walls and then we applied lime mortar that we can see within the masonry and also lime wash uh, where, where the plaster has kind of happened. It takes around six to seven days for the slaking of lime. Uh, lime as a material is something very soft and flexible because lime uh, when you apply it on the wall it lets the wall breathe. Different ways and different admixtures that are used in for lime plaster. Apply a bowl to it, garam karaza, nantar taake me dil taakaza. Un bell le na bell thodo on, chale chelo on, the pan taake taakaza. Iti bizo biso on, nantar taake taakaza. Chala dahate bara dio, to dio le saala ga, the pani mang nantar mala me dewa paraza. Un chuna pani ye sab mixture karo, kyo mal? The main idea behind the conservation project is that engage with the people who are around and not only it ends at the village but it somewhere reaches to the city of Mumbai as well. The project is still under process, so not completed yet in 2023. Uh, maybe we can start the presentation.
involved, which we did as our uh, phase two. Now, along with that, during the process, we also realized that uh, they've been using the uh, courtyard too, a uh, lot of time for some festivals. And we also realized that it can kind of give a good platform for them to, uh, maybe if uh, school events are happening. So we kind of proposed this stage over there, which becomes like a co uh, walkway around the courtyard too, and it leads them to the bastion. So it kind of connects completely. So even if as tourists, someone comes in, so there's this complete circuit where they enter from the archway, uh, they see the inner uh, smaller courtyard, they take the step up, access the bastion, and from the right side, they kind of come at this bigger courtyard. Now also for the courtyard one, our proposal uh, was also uh, a lot uh, uh, limited to uh, not much of landscape because even as corporation they said they wanted less maintenance so that's why you can see more of uh, gravel than uh, landscape form so these are some of the uh, photos of uh, our process where the front this is a front arcade where we you know kind of uh, so this is this is still going on but this is uh, i guess last 2020 uh, november photo taken. So uh, on our left side, you can see the steps leading to Bastion is something that we kind of, uh, uh, that was a conjecture from our side or intervention from our side where we created a, uh, where we created a stage and a uh, walkway, which, which kind of leads you to the Bastion, but in a way that will kind of merges well with the existing uh, built, built form of it. The restoration of stone uh, archway was something where we had, uh, we did less of intervention as such. Uh, we just did a cleaning, uh, stone cleaning for the fort wall and uh, uh, removal of the existing cement plaster which was there. Uh, the granaries also is something, uh, when we actually removed a layer of it uh, from uh, the cement concrete, we also found uh, uh, traces of lime plaster so that's why we decided to kind of again do lime plaster and lime wash over it the uh, granaries structure uh, that's the uh, now even for the conjecture part which uh, was mentioned in the video uh, our proposal as as it was a huge patch of land we didn't want it to be misused as well. So uh, the proposal, uh, the layout which we see is in this Portuguese landscape because it's a, it was built by Portuguese. So that's why it was a conjecture and we made this Portuguese garden over there, uh, Portuguese layout garden. Uh, also while uh, construction, we uh, realized there's this mango tree, then we kind of incorporated that where, when, you know, when, con when someone enters in the bigger, bigger space, so then they can see uh, the tree and the seating there, and then the landscape is around. So these are a few more pictures of the space. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is this was one structure which was uh, in dilapidated state because there was a tree right at the junction of the for of the walls. So this is uh, this is the only structure which we had to uh, like kind of number and pull it down. Apart from that, we have not as such pulled down any fort wall. There might be some addition, but uh, uh, we had done the structural auditing for it, and it was uh, it came out that the the fort the tree roots were kind of disturbing the structure, and there was like this kind of split between the wall, and hence we had to kind of pull this down. Overall, uh, after looking at the, uh, during the conservation, what we also felt was uh, uh, along with uh, like the way the community was also responding to the structure, we also incorporated something called uh, a heritage walk where uh, we wanted everyone to be, everyone to witness uh, a process of a conservation work. A lot of time what happens is when we have a heritage walk, we just directly see the end, end, uh, uh, end point of a conservation work executed. But in this, what we had done is we had a, a heritage walk conducted, which would show them the entire process of, of making uh, locals aware of the process of a conservation work than directly seeing the end part. Uh, now, after looking at the response, uh, from the tourist and from the community as well of how uh, the, uh, the co local corporation also supported in funding and uh, they were uh, they asked us to kind of uh, you know how can we kind of uh, apart from social impact can we have more economic impact also considered for the fort so the storage granaries our next proposal is where we have proposed uh, roofing over the storage granaries and uh, we can have uh, you know we can curate 
a museum inside it because there are a lot of uh, which we had actually talks. Uh, there are some cannons, uh, unclaimed cannons overall in Mumbai and there are no place for it to display. And as such, uh, for the fort, they didn't have any uh, artifacts to display. So maybe this becomes like a place for, uh, for displaying in the Godbanda fort. So these are some of the future proposals that are estimated maybe by 2024. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, unlike the Godbandar fort, which was a much smaller area, so we are talking about say 4,000 square meter, Aosa fort was a much bigger area to kind of deal with. So this, this is approximately 70,000 square meter. So when we kind of started off with the project, we were taken aback definitely by the scale of the fort as well. And uh, you know, if we could kind of apply similar strategies that we applied at Godbandar as well. Um, one of the things that was uh, there in this uh, fort and its context was basically there was uh, some amount of encroachment that uh, exists right at the entrance of the fort and a, a lot of farming that kind of goes uh, around the fort area as well. So there is this kind of coexistence that is uh, that kind of uh, uh, is there uh, in the Ausa fort area. So. So historically speaking, uh, just to kind of give a brief history of the fort, uh, this fort was built during the Bahamani dynasty, which was primarily existing in the Maharashtra and southern, uh, and some southern areas of uh, uh, India. And this was built around 1357, post which uh, it went to the uh, Nizams and then it went to the Mughals. So of course the fort sees a lot of uh, influences of various cultures that uh, kind of ruled over it uh, over a period of time. Uh, since the fort was built during the Bahamani uh, dynasty, there was a peculiar architectural style that is observed uh, in the way the Bahamanis built because it was in response to the different kind of war strategies that they had, they had kind of created over time. And also uh, there was a lot of change of weapons. There was, uh, was a lot of metal cannons. So of course the architectural styles also then kind of adopted to those uh, strategies and uh, techniques as well. So those uh, strategies, uh, architectural styles are actually observed in uh, uh, certain forts which are nearby Ausa fort as well, the Udgir fort, the Nardurka fort and the Paranda fort. Uh, so which involves actually concentric layers of fortification walls. Uh, the battlements were also built in a particular style uh, so that the cannons could be then directed and could be then targeted um, in whichever direction that they would be, uh, in whichever direction uh, they would have the enemy. Uh, and of course, because uh, this was uh, situated near the Deccan area, so we have a lot of black basalt stone and lime mortar that has been used for the construction of these forts. Uh, so the Ausa fort, architecturally speaking, is uh, situated in, in, a, in a kind of depression and which has high uh, along the outer side of the fort. And uh, that apart, uh, because of the Bahmani dynasty, there are a lot of Turkish and European influences that we see. Uh, certain amount, certain types of inscriptions have been seen. There are inscriptions, Persian inscriptions and Turkish inscriptions, even on the cannons that have been found on the fort. Um, definitely, there is a lot of coast rubble masonry that has been uh, uh, that has been adopted as a technique of construction, uh, and with black basalt stone. And um, also, uh, customized sizes of bricks were used for the. Uh, for building the battlements along the fortification walls as well. So, um, like we can see, there is this concentric layer of um, architecture that exists. So, on the outermost side, we have the moat wall. Then we have the first fortification wall and the second fortification wall. That apart, there are about three to four fresh water sources that exist in the fort, um, out of which two of them are along the first fortification wall and one is in the innermost area of the fort. That apart, uh, most uh, the other prominent buildings that exist in the fort, uh, we have the main entrance, which is the Lohabandi gate, 
which forms the main uh, entrance structure, which then continues into the Ghod Tabela, uh, which is primarily the area that was uh, where the horses were kept. This continues into a more judicial building, uh, the Tehsil building. And on the innermost area of the fort, we have the Ambar Khana, which was uh, primarily the uh, room for storage. Purposes, and a very interesting building called the Pani Mahal, which is an underground structure and which has some light wells on the roof um, and primarily used for uh, keeping uh, storage of water um, in the structure. Um, also, um, another, uh, another peculiar characteristic of the fort is that it has about seven entrance gates, uh, about 23 bastions along the first fortification wall, uh, about 11 very interesting cannons that uh, exist and have been found in the premises of the fort. Uh, there is also a Jahanuma palace, which is more like the viewing gallery. And uh, some amount of archaeological ruins were also uh, seen uh, in bits and parts on the inner area of the fort. So, um, when we kind of started with the conservation work, um, another, a plus plus situation ideally we would say was that uh, there was some amount, some amount of conservation work which was done previously. So which was uh, the conservation of the second fortification wall or the innermost wall. Uh, some structures that were also conserved uh, including the Rani Mahal, the Ghor Tabela and um, the Tahsil building. So in a way, um, when we kind of came to the fort, uh, it was not in a very shabby or a very dilapidated condition as such. Uh, that way we had a very clear understanding of the uh, architectural characteristics of the fort and the conditions of the fort. Uh, so some of these works that were previously carried out uh, before we started our work, um, in 2022. Um, so when we uh, kind of uh, started with the overall uh, condition assessment, uh, of course there is a lot of dense vegetation that was seen. So to kind of begin with drone mapping or to begin with any such techniques of documentation was very difficult. There was a lot of vegetation growth uh, that was seen in the Percot area. Uh, the conditions of the cannons were also not really great. Uh, a lot of moss uh, was seen in the wells. A lot of seepage was observed in most of the structures which were also previously uh, restored and uh, but the most deteriorated wall was the first fortification wall so um, so of course all the condition mapping had to be done manually uh, all the walls were documented manually uh, and physically and kind of uh, uh, all the kind of condition drawings were produced uh, with all the openings marked as well. Um, the Pani Mahal, which was uh, the most, in, which is the most interesting building of the fort, uh, of course, again, had a lot of moisture increase that was happening from the terrace. There was a lot of discoloration, a lot of flaking of plaster uh, that had happened internally. The Tahsil building also had uh, some amount of vegetation growth, uh, discoloration of uh, stones, and again, there was uh, some amount of moisture ingress that had also happened um, in the ceiling area. Um, even the Ghor Tabela area, we had very similar problems. Uh, so, um, uh, so, of course, we had to kind of address these buildings also when we kind of uh, started to uh, analyze the phases of work. So uh, to start off with the conservation strategy, one of the things uh, that we decided to do was, of course, kind of have a very similar approach to what we had for Godbandar Fort, where we decided to kind of analyze the visitor movement patterns, which were primarily happening along the external side, but also on the internal side of the fort. So uh, there was, of course, a conscious decision then taken that, uh, you know, the conservation works need to happen parallel. So we started to kind of break down uh, phase-wise work where phase one would involve the conservation of the uh, outermost, the first fortification wall. And at the same time, we'll conserve, uh, we would be conserving the buildings on the internal side as well. Again, um, kind of taking the same approach as the Godbandar Fort, we decided to kind of have uh, a kind of landscape amenity in the area of the fort. Um, and of course, archaeological investigations were also to be carried out in the uh, phase one itself. So the work started in June 2022. So some of the work that was completed, uh, so we completed the first fortification wall, almost about 70% of the wall, the conservation of the wall has been completed. Uh, so all the battlements, uh, the inspection path, 
along the first fortification walls have been restored. The bricks, as per the sizes that were seen uh, on the site, the same sizes of bricks were uh, customized and were used for uh, restoring the first fortification wall. Uh, of course, uh, at certain places, structural intervention was required, but comparatively, not that much. Uh, none of the walls were in a very dilapidated condition. So some few areas we had to kind of completely rebuild uh, the walls. The wells which are uh, existing in the first fortification area, uh, the, the desilting process was carried out for them as well and they were completely clean along with the parapets uh, that were around the well area. The Pani Mahal too, uh, the waterproofing uh, was completed uh, on the terrace along with um, uh, waterproofing uh, along with the lime plastering and um, the cleaning of the water uh, in the Pani Mahal area as well. Uh, of course, during the cleaning, uh, there were some interesting findings. We saw uh, quite a few uh, cannonballs that were actually submerged inside in the water. So there were some interesting findings there. Uh, for Goat Tabela area as well, uh, the water waterproofing and cleaning of vegetation was completed. Uh, now, parallel, uh, parallelly, we had some archaeological excavations also going on uh, in the inner area of the fort, and um, some interesting findings came along, uh, which is uh, which were like these uh, submerged structures. One of them, uh, a very interesting fountain that you can see in the most uh, left-hand side picture, uh, with some beautiful carvings. Uh, we also uh, assume that uh, there is a possibility that one of the structures is like an hammam. Um, so these scientifically excavated uh, structures were also restored. Um, it, it was a necessity rather to restore them because they were all mostly uh, built in mud mortar and they were almost in a collapsed condition. So the walls were, uh, since it was difficult uh, to find any kind of record um, about these structures as to what these structures could be and how they uh, back then, so it was a conscious decision to kind of rebuild these walls to a certain height of two to three feet and were completely um, uh, covered with coping. Uh, that apart, uh, a lot of interesting antiquities also were found, uh, some coins, some kind of metal items. So, um, Post the archaeological findings, um, there was a slight deviation uh, from what was planned in phase one, uh, where we had to completely skip the whole landscape uh, visitor amenity part, and we kind of continued to uh, finish the first fortification wall, and uh, that led to even um, analyzing what, how the approach should be for the phase two of the fort. So the phase two is yet to begin. So the proposal for the phase two, based on what was uh, what happened in phase one, uh, uh, of course, deviated quite a bit from what was originally planned. Um, we have now proposed an interpretation center in the Tahsil building, uh, which would cater to all the archaeological findings uh, and the antiquities that we have found during the scientific excavation. Um, there is also a proposal of adaptive reuse of the Ghor Tabela area, where we have a canon gallery because of the interesting cannons that are uh, available at the site. Um, there will also be a provision of a souvenir shop. And that apart, the rest of the conservation work uh, for the rest of the wall area will also be completed along with the moat wall. So these are some of the visuals for the proposed uh, cannon gallery. The interpretation center. Yeah. 